Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hi, everybody. This is Wednesday night, and that means it's time for Friends and Fiction. It is the happiest night of the week. We are all so happy to be here with you. I'm Kristen Harmel. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I'm Patty Callahan Henry. And I'm Mary Kay Andrews. This is Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support indie bookstores, authors, and librarians. Tonight, we'll be talking with Victoria V.E. Schwab, and then in the after show, we'll be joined by Greer McAllister, whose writing now is G.R. McAllister. Later in the show, we'll also have a special announcement about Patty's new book, so you will not want to miss that. As you know, I'm so excited about Patty I that know, I'm to you. <laughs> As you know, we continue to encourage you to support independent booksellers when and where you can. And one way to do that is to visit our own Friends and Fiction Bookshop.org page, where you can find Victoria and Greer's books and books by the four of us and our past guests at a discount. And we want to remind you, speaking of being really excited about books, <laughs> is that Christy and Mary Kay have brand new books coming out. We've been talking like next season in the spring. Now we're down to saying in the next couple weeks. So Christie's The Wedding Veil will be out March 29th. And Mary Kay's The Home Wreckers will be out on May 3rd. And y'all, they're both so incredible. And we got to be with them when they were writing them. I know how much work was put into them. I know the twists and the turns and the plot lines. And y'all are going to love it. So I really want you to think about pre-ordering by your favorite authors because it is a great way to make sure that they get lots of love and support. And if you've loved Christy and Mary Kay's books in the past, or even if you just love this show and you want to show your support for two of the people who go all out every single week to make this great experience, do consider pre-ordering. Of course, they're available wherever books are sold, but if you want a hand-signed first edition of both books, with a little free gift. Actually, it's kind of a big free gift, to be honest. <laughs> you can order the spring box from our friends at Independent Bookstore Oxford Exchange. You'll receive a beautiful delivery of both books, each of them autographed by these two superstars as soon as they're released. And if you haven't read Kristen's or my 2021 books, Surviving Savannah and The Forest of Vanishing Stars, they'll be in paperback this spring. And we have another exciting announcement. Tonight is just like wall to wall. I know. It's just boom, 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 boom. <laughs> we have another exciting announcement for you tonight. We're delighted to announce a Coffee with Friends three-month promotion with our friend and partner, Charleston Coffee Roasters. What goes better than coffee and a great book? How about friends to chat with over a cup of joe about the books you love? We call that a match made in heaven. Sean, why do you always put the graphic over my face? <laughs> I think that's intentional. Oh, thanks. Yeah, put it over their faces. <laughs> to celebrate this fun new promotion, we have a little surprise for you tonight. We'd love to welcome not only Lowell Gross, the president of Charleston Coffee Roasters, but also another friend of Charleston Coffee Roasters, our friend and friends in fiction founder emeritus, and coffee aficionado, Mary Alice Monroe. Sean, can you bring Lowell and Mary Alice on, please? Hi. 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 Fun to be back. See you all. Welcome. Yeah, here we go. Cheers. Cheers. I love that. We are here. so happy. Beautiful to see you. months. Yeah. Beautiful. On both beautiful. sides. On both yeah. sides. 
So we're so happy to see y'all. Mary Alice, it's so good to see you back in the square. Yes, and yes, Lowell, it's, it's fun. It's, it's fun. And Lowell, it's so nice to meet you. So Lowell, we're so glad to be partnering with Charleston Coffee Roasters again. Can you tell us a bit about your company? Certainly. I'm, I'm very happy and we're very excited to be partnering with you. Uh, Charleston Coffee Roasters was founded on producing a uh, the best tasting coffee that the, the consumer desires and two main principles kind of guiding our company, making sure that we're purchasing coffee correctly from farmers who are taking care of their environment, their ecology and their workers and using sustainable coffee practices. And we're very proud of why we've gotten up to about 99% of our coffee is all organic. Oh, so, that's amazing. Yep. Yeah. So we're very excited about that. And the second print main principle with our company is making sure we're giving back to our community, being a, a socially responsible mm -hmm. corporate citizen. Um, and one of our biggest partnerships along the years, we've been involved with obviously with Mary Alice with the sea turtles and she let us can got the connection with the aquarium and what a great organization, everything they do on the environmental side, the animals and the people that work there. And we're very excited now to uh, announce that we'll be the lead sponsor of their nutritional care program at the South Carolina Aquarium. Oh, oh that's congratulations. Awesome. That's amazing. That's we're great we're extremely excited about that. Um, okay, Mary, Mary Alice, we know you've worked with Charleston Coffee Roasters in the past. Would you tell us a little bit about that partnership and what you love about them? Well, we, I've been a turtle lady for a long time, and Lowell has, I got to know him because he always supported the turtle teams we had with his coffee. And so then the, the piece de resistance was when he we went, worked together for the Beach House blend, which really yeah. rocks. I got to help create this blend, and it's really, really delicious if you like full-bodied coffee. But all the blends at Charleston Coffee Roasters are so delicious. And as Patty said, I am a or who said a cat coffee? Was it you, Christy? I'm a coffee. Yes, me. Yeah. I, <laughs> you know me, you know I love coffee and I drink a lot. So, and isn't this mug cute, by the way? This yeah. Is yeah. I love it. It's a turtle. Yep. Lowell has been a fixture in Charleston, a, a community supporter, not just the aquarium, but for the sea turtles, which explains the logo. That yeah. is a cookie yeah. bean with a turtle. Yeah. So how can we not love him? <laughs> so pleased that he's with Friends in Fiction now. Yeah. So Agreed. exciting. Yeah. No, it's the only coffee that we drink. I mean, I love your coffee, but my husband was probably like the most excited of all of us about this promotion because he <laughs> loves your coffee, like loves it. So he was really, really excited. Well, Utah's blend is the best. I'm just saying. It is. It's delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Don't really hit it out of the park. Wow. That's a good one. It was a great contribution with Mary Alice and bringing this all together. And she's gave us all her input and we put it together and boom, this just, just, it hit it. And it's becoming very, very popular. I think it's uh, it's one of our top sellers on our website. Great. That's right. awesome. Oh my gosh. I'm not surprised at all. Um, and as a part of this promotion, we're going to have some fun giveaways here on the friends and fiction page. Plus Charleston coffee roasters will be off offering book and coffee bundles featuring the books of the friends and fiction authors plus a special 20% off code good for the next three months on all bagged coffee on their website. Lowell, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, we're again, very excited for this partnership. We wanna bring everybody in, have a chance to purchase our coffees at a great discount and, and kind of supporting, and we love supporting all the independent bookstores. We work with Mary Alice Monroe with Buxton Books in Charleston and, and doing that. So now kind of bringing in, the, allowing your community to uh, be able to purchase these organic coffees at a great price. And as you were saying before, we cover the gamut as far as taste profiles. So we develop the intrinsic flavor of the bean and bring that out. And a couple I'm currently enjoying is our breakfast blend and our um, single origin Honduran on the lighter side, really kind of bright, citrusy, light, um, sweet in taste. And then on the darker roast, we have the Beach House blend is always one of our favorite, my favorite too. It's just rich, full taste, and it's a, awesome. a great tasting coffee. Well, I think we can all raise a mug of Charleston <laughs> yes. coffee roasted coffee to that. And um, before we go, Mary Alice, can you quickly tell us what you have coming up in the mm. next couple of months? Oh, thank you, Kristen. Yes, yes. it's... um. 
Right here, a year ago, we announced my first middle grade book, The Islanders. And so I'm really excited to have the second the second book. And this, it's a series. And it's called Search for Treasure. And it's coming out in June. We're really excited. Hopefully, I'll see you here then. And um, no new adult book this year, paperback of Summer of Lost and Found. So a little bit more quiet for me. But I love this middle grade. I tell you, talk, talking to those kids is wonderful. And I... I'm amazed how many adults are loving the book. So it's been a real adventure. Thank you. Awesome. Well, we'll That's look awesome. forward to celebrating with you in a couple of months when those books Thanks. are a little bit closer. So Lowell, we're happy to have you here to celebrate tonight. We're excited about this great partnership. And uh, thanks for being here. It was wonderful to see you both. It was a lot of pleasure. Oh, so great. Thank you, everybody. Bye, y'all. So good Bye. to see you. Oh, that was fun. Yeah. Aww. All right, everyone out there, let's show our new partner the power of the friends and fiction community. Not only do we hope you use the discount code Coffee with Friends on the Charleston Coffee Roasters website to get 20% off of all bagged coffee, but you we also hope that all of you out there will follow Charleston Coffee Roasters on Facebook and Instagram. So that was a lot of fun, but I am still breathless from finishing The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue last night. I don't know why I didn't read it sooner. I Now I wish I had. It was absolutely incredible. So I cannot <laughs> wait a second more before we bring on our guest for the evening. Me neither. Let's do it. Victoria V.E. Schwab is the number one New York Times bestselling author of more than 20 books, including the acclaimed Shades of Magic series, the Villain series, the Cassidy Blake series, and the international bestseller, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. Victoria's work has received critical acclaim, has been translated into over two dozen, and for those of us who don't do math, that's more than 24, <laughs> and has been... <laughs> Optioned for television and Even I that. <laughs> boom for television and film. First Kill, a YA vampire series based on Victoria's short story of the same name, is currently in the works at Netflix with none other than Emma Roberts Bellatrist Productions producing. That's so awesome. Good. Victoria attended Washington University in St. Louis and lived for a while in Nashville before packing up and getting out of town, yeah. <laughs> getting out of town to Europe when she's not haunting Paris streets or trudging up English hillsides. Victoria lives in Edinburgh, Scotland. Did you see how I said that right? I'm impressed. <laughs> and she is usually tucked in the corner of a coffee shop dreaming up monsters and we're hoping she's going to show her kittens on screen tonight yes. so cute sean can you bring victoria on please hi, hi. hi victoria. one of the kittens has just settled down next to me so, it's so sweet precarious. it's precarious but we don't believe that those kittens were misbehaving earlier so, <laughs> so bad <laughs> They're so bad, but hi, thank you so much for having me. Oh, we are absolutely thrilled to have you here. So Gallant comes out next week. Can you start off tonight? It's such a beautiful God, book, beautiful. A gorgeous oh, cover. I know, we were all just saying yeah. how beautifully packaged it is. Yeah. Can you start us off tonight by telling us, oh my gosh, look at that. Oh, yes, the end papers. Are... <gasps> look at those gorgeous oh, yeah. end papers. We figure out how to pitch it, yeah. <laughs> oh, that is amazing. Could you start off by telling us a little bit about it tonight? Of course. Gallant is the story of Olivia Pryor, a girl who has spent the vast majority of her life in uh, Maryland's home for independent girls an orphanage. And she knows nothing of her family except that she has a journal from her mother that seems to devolve into madness. But at the back of the journal is a letter that looks lucid. And at the end of the letter to Olivia are three warnings. Uh, one, that the shadows are not real. The second is that the dreams, the, the dreams will not hurt her. And the third is that she will be safe so long as she stays away from Gallant. And she has no oh, idea what Gallant is, what it refers to until she receives a letter from an uncle she's never met inviting her to come home to the family estate, Gallant. And when she gets oh. there, she discovers no uncle. She discovers a house that is practically abandoned, 
a garden being strangled by strange dead weeds and a garden wall at the back of the estate with a locked door that seems to lead nowhere. Oh my gosh! <laughs> you know, gee, there's there's really nothing intriguing about that description at all. Yes. I don't know. That's amazing. Describe it as the secret garden meets Crimson Peak. <gasps> I was gonna say there's like yeah. there's like a little secret garden vibe in there. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's gallant. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Sounds amazing. Well, you have crafted an incredible career, Victoria, ranging from middle grade to young adult to adult fiction. The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue, which is geared toward adults, has been absolutely everywhere, to put it mildly. And we'll be talking about that book in just a minute. You've written books like City of Ghosts and Tunnel of Bones for middle grade readers and books like The Monsters of Verity and the Archive series for young adults. So you've really done it all. Um, can you talk a little bit about straddling these different genres and how you've managed to do it so successfully? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't know. I certainly didn't start out successful. I want to like be very, very clear about that. In fact, mm -hmm. like the first three to four books of my career, uh, I thought was going to be it. Like they, my wow. first book came out and nobody read it and it went out of print 18 months <laughs> after. And oh, my wow. second book yeah. came out and nobody read it. And my third book came out and you can see a pattern happening here. And um, <laughs> about three books in, I thought, oh, I was 25. So I started very young. I just want to like get that out of the way. But I was 25 and I kind of felt I was being pulled by my publisher at the time. Like there's nothing here. Like you're, it's not going to work. Oh. And so oh. I sat down and decided that if my career was going to end that quickly, that it was going to end on my terms. And I was going to write a book that I didn't care if anyone else liked. I was going to write it entirely for myself. It was, the, and it's a, a, you know, a realization we should make at the beginning of our careers, but we don't always, there's always an awareness of audience, but I just thought, well, if it's going to be an audience of one, it's going to be an audience of me. And um, I sat down and wrote a very strange novel called vicious, which is about super villains. It is essentially like uh, like the secret history with supervillains. It's it's very very dark and very weird. And I thought nobody will read it, but at least I will be satisfied. And people read it, more people than had read awesome. books one, two, and three. And I started from that point on. No matter what I wrote, no matter what age I wrote for, I just instead of thinking about audience, instead of thinking about anyone else, I just looked at an a, an age of myself. So when I write middle grade. I'm writing for 11 year old me because wow. I don't know who anyone else was. And when I'm writing YA, I'm writing for 17 year old me. And when I'm writing adult, I'm writing for whatever age I am. At the time I, I, I sat down and finally started writing Addie LaRue when I was 30. And I think you can tell because so much of the identity in that book is that arbitrary line of adulthood, that sudden yeah. told by the world that you should know what you're doing. And so I think that the only thing my books really have in common is that they're written for a version of myself. Oh, I love it. That's I love so great. That. <laughs> I'm scribbling down notes as you say. <laughs> I know, I know. Right? what great it's advice. So great. Yeah. It really is. Well, and you have described Gallant as your first all ages read, which I love for so many reasons. Like just, I think we all have this idea of like what it would be like to have like multiple generations of people reading our book at the same time, or like families really having a story that like they can all enjoy together. And yeah. so this is absolutely brilliant and fascinating to all of us because, you know, in publishing, they usually kind of make you choose, like you have to sort of be in this little box. So can you tell us a little bit about like what makes this an all ages read and how have you accomplished this amazing book that will appeal equally to young and adult readers? I'm laughing because it's like, it's like an all ages read is the spin that you give to, it doesn't sit anywhere cleanly in the book. <laughs> I like, I didn't want it to. The story I wanted to tell, you know, again, talking about that kind of the deviation in your mind between writer you and author you and the writer you has the story you want to tell and the author you understands that the yeah. story has to go on itself somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I just, I kept hitting those divides in the story and seeing what I would need to do to make it fit cleanly. But those weren't the things I wanted to do for the story. Nice. And so what I ended up with was a story that I think in some ways has middle grade qualities because the conflict at the crux of it is one of interiority of internal identity. And then there are obviously she's a teenager. So that makes you think you want to place it in YA, but there's no romantic element. It really is a story of found family. And, and then there's very adult 
elements to it. It's a death tale. It's a story about the underworld and about loss and grief. And so I'm very, very fortunate. I This is not a book I think I would have been able to write and publish earlier on in my career. Yeah. I think that there was an extreme luxury of coming on the success of Addie LaRue yeah. and of being able to say to my publisher early on, I'm not sure where this book is going to sit on shelves and having the publisher say, why don't you just write the story you want to write and we'll figure out how to market it. It's amazing. That is That's awesome. a great thing to hear. It's, it's a first. Let me tell you, it's a first <laughs> for everything. I like, I think one of the things that made my career really difficult early on is because I don't tend to fit cleanly into categories mm -hmm. and I, it wasn't seen as a strength. Like I want to be really explicit with that. It was seen as a, as a detriment. It was, I was told, over and over and over again, I wasn't commercial enough. I wasn't mainstream enough that it would be difficult to sell my books. That it would require a lot of hand selling. And it did. And independent booksellers hand sold it. They're the and ones. Readers hand sold it. And people had a connection to the story. But even now I'm told, you know, Addie has spent like 40 something weeks on the New York Times list. And I'm still told <laughs> wow. like, oh, you don't really write easily marketable books. Whoops. <laughs> wow. We're sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like that one was marketed okay. Yeah, I know. You did a great job. But yeah, every we can help you Addie with LaRue. that. Yeah. Well, yeah. When I turned in Addie LaRue, I was convinced it would be the nail in the coffin of my career because oh it was a complete divergence from everything I had written before. And like, I was, I have a science fiction and fantasy publisher. I was like, I don't even know if they know how to market. I mean, Tor obviously proved that they did. But I mean, I think there's a, it, it's like in retrospect, it, we call it a reward. And before it happens, we call it a risk. So I think uh, that yeah, that's it's true. the luxury of success. Now I got to write that down again. <laughs> <laughs> you can come back and watch it, Mary Kay. Tell you how, how courageous though, because I, you know, I think as writers, we're told throughout our careers, you have to follow the rules. You, you know, yes, be creative, but be creative within the constraints we've given you. And you just, exactly. you just followed you, you did you. And I think that's incredible. And, and I mean, look, look what you have to show for it. I will say I've been, I think, you know, we have positive reinforcement and, and I think that the reinforcement that I felt over the years has outweighed the risk in that I, I've noticed because I write across an age spectrum for where things sit on a shelf, over the years I would have a reader come up to me in an event and the reader would not match the age of the book at all. Yeah. I would have, you know, a grandparent come up to me with one of my middle grade books, but I'll never forget. I had a 10 year old boy come up to me with vicious, which is this super villain secret history. And I was like, what are you doing with this book? Like, I'm just glad he likes a book. Like, yeah. so I, think I like writing stories that to your point earlier can just appeal to intergenerational reading so that parents can read them with their children's yeah. family can read it. Friends can read it. And I think, I always talk about books like jigsaw puzzles, like they should have a lower age limit advisory, but no upper age limit. Oh, and I think I you know, like eight plus or a, a 10 plus on a, on a puzzle or a game. And I think, I think that we do such a disservice when we suggest that there's a time we age out of a specific reading category. Cause I think we discover and rediscover new things about a book when we come back to it at different ages. Yes. I agree with that. Yeah. When you were just talking about writing for yourself, I was thinking about um, this section and Stephen King has a book on writing. It's called On Writing. <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> and, and it's such an extraordinary book, but he talks in there about choosing your ideal reader and then writing to that ideal reader. And for him, it's his wife, Tabitha. But I love the idea that the ideal reader is that person in us. Yeah. Yeah. So that's extraordinary. But I want to talk a little bit about the invisible life of Addie LaRue. So Slate Magazine called the book Epic Yet Intimate, Sweeping But Not Sprawling, which I think is such a great description. It's truly astonishing the way you handle the scope thousands of years. Can you talk to us about the way you actually came up with the idea for this tale, I think you told us earlier before we were on air, it took you how long? 10 years. Wow. So tell us about coming up with it and dealing with this yeah. complex tale. I mean, I think it was a lesson in patience. Yeah. 
I, mm. I, just because, I mean, we talk, I think there's this urge when you have an idea for a story to start writing that story immediately. Yes. And yeah. I have a fairly long steep time with my stories. So <laughs> most, I always use like the metaphor of a six burner stove. So if my mind is a six burner stove, I have pots on all of the stoves. They're not all up on high heat. Most of them, like most of them are on low heat and simmering for a long time. Because of that, when I do start writing a novel, I don't abandon it. I don't have any trunked novels because by the time I sit down to write the novel, it's like steeped. I know what it's going to be. But with Addie, I got the first seeds of the idea when I was 23 and I, the book came out when I was 33. Oh, and, wow. um, and it truly was the first couple of years I didn't have all the ingredients for my meal. And then after that, I had the ingredients and I became terrified of writing it because you know I, you'll you'll understand this about me very quickly i love metaphors and i always say that like an idea when it's in your head is like this beautiful glass orb filled with light it's perfect it's flawless because you haven't made it and then the act of writing the idea down into a first draft is the act of smashing that glass orb yes. against the wall and the act of revising is like desperately trying to reassemble broken glass <laughs> <laughs> to try and make it look that way it again it looks like, like itself. but I became so enamored with the glass orb in my mind I didn't want to write it down because I knew something would be lost there's always something lost in physics it's the difference between potential and kinetic energy like you're gonna lose something and I was scared I was just like desperately afraid and then when I was 29 30 years old uh, so like seven years into it for that, I realized, oh, I'm going to die without writing this book. Like, that's what's going to happen is like, it's going to be the book of mine. I had 19 other books published in that time. So it wasn't like I was never going to be published, but it was going to be the book that I, I let die for want of perfection. Mm -hmm. And then I realized like, oh, well, that's no good. I can either now decide to let the story live only in my mind and be perfect there or I can embrace the fact that all writing is an act of imperfection and I can get it out. And Every, so all writing is an act of imperfection. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like, like I'm having a therapy session. Right? I, I know. I feel the same. I know. I know. I'm like, wow. <laughs> I know. I'm like, the wrong person yeah. is sitting on the couch. She's sitting on the couch giving us. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Welcome to my right couch. Right. Welcome to writer therapy. Um, it is That's going to be a new name of our show. Welcome. <laughs> yeah, we'll get a shingle that says the doctor is in. <laughs> but all four of you, you know that. You know, like you know that so intimately that it's this. You have the first person. You know, the first way you have to get out of is your own. You have to like find yes. a way to come to terms with the fact mm -hmm. that you're going to ruin something by making it. And like, <laughs> I love the comments, um, but yeah, and, and it's, it was hard, but I just realized at some point, like I needed it. I needed it to exist so that I could let go of it. And the beautiful thing that happens, you know, when you finish writing a book is that you, you've been carrying all of that weight yourself. And then when right. you finish it, you get to put it down and, and it becomes other people's, right? Like you get to hand the weight off and the weight suddenly gets like held up by, however many hands read the book. And so like, I just, I just really needed to get to that point where somebody else could hold on to Addie's story for me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, just r real quick, Victoria, for people who haven't read it, can yeah. you tell us very briefly about it? We actually have a viewer out there, Elizabeth Johnson Howard saying, yeah. what should readers know about your Addie LaRue book who haven't read it yet yeah. or are unsure about it being for them? How would you hand sell it like a bookseller? So The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue is the story of a young woman in 18th century France who is afraid that she's going to be born and buried in the same 10 meter plot. She's just has, she has no, no future, no adventure, no anything. And so she ends up making a deal with the devil to live forever. And the devil doesn't want to do the deal because he doesn't get her soul until the deal's done. If she lives forever, the deal's not done. And so she says to him in a moment of weakness, you can have my soul when I don't want it anymore. And sensing an opportunity, the devil grants her her request to live forever and to get his soul. He curses her to be forgotten by everyone she meets. So the story is set over 300 years as Addie tries to leave a mark on a world that can't remember her. And it's set over one year in New York City when she meets a young man who does remember her. Amazing. Isn't it such, it's just such a brilliant concept. It's what, oh my gosh, I, 
<laughs> it, 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 just the idea of the book is so smart, but then your execution, Victoria, yeah. is Thank freaking you. brilliant. Like Thank brilliant. You. <laughs> it sounds like you knew it though. Like you knew this was the book. I knew it was my once in a lifetime book. I knew it was like of all my works. Which sounds so narcissistic, and that's not. No, no, no it does not. It does not. At all. You, you, I think we all have that instinct. I mean, yeah. I think sometimes it's dead wrong, like not in the like in the yeah. opposite way. Like this is the book that's going to ruin my career. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. The one, yeah. you know. But I didn't. That's not narcissistic. It's at all. it's yeah. just that I felt like it it had to be important because it didn't let go after ten years. You know, it got it lasted, and I knew that I wanted this book like to be the thing that outlived me, which is such a weird way to put it. But I just was like, I knew it as I was writing it and that I knew it when it was done. And the reason I knew it, the only way I can describe it is going back to that glass orb. It's the closest I've ever come to putting the glass orb back together. Like oh, it to this day that. is almost identical to the thing that existed in my mind. Now it didn't come out that way in the first draft. The revision was the act of making it back. But by the time it hit shelves, it is exactly what was in my head. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't what that feeling is like. And I've written 30 books. <laughs> <laughs> but I will tell you, the success is just as ruinous as failure in that way because everything, like Gallant then became the book I wrote after Addy. And right. like when you then become this thing where you're like trying to chase smoke, you're trying to figure out if you'll ever feel that way again. Like yeah. it's just, you almost have to embrace that that is the, the strangeness, not the norm of a writing career. Like, yeah. I don't think I'll ever capture that again. Wow. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I was going to say, it sounds like I, you've captured it even I just sitting here talking you. about it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We'll see. We, we'll we see. have faith in you. No, I have faith. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, um, you know, you wrote a beautiful essay a year and a half ago for Oprah Daily about coming out. And in it, you talked about writing stories with outsiders at their centers who are at odds with their world. And I think that's so powerful, not just because it seems to come so naturally from your own lived experience, but also because it's so universal. I think all of us for different reasons at different times in our lives have felt that way. I think that's especially true for those of us who lose themselves and find themselves in books. And I wonder if a, that isn't a particularly common experience in young people, in your YA audience and in your middle grade audience. And I wish you'd talk a little bit about why you think that central theme, a person at odds with their world who decides to escape or change is so powerful in storytelling and how it relates to the arc of your writing career. Yeah. Oh, it's a long you. question, I know. Well, I've got it. I like it. I love it. Um, you know, I think it is, I think about this a lot because, so I started, um, I wrote my first published novel when I was 22 and I came out when I was 28. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't, like I was in the closet a lot of that time to myself as well. So a lot of the time I was writing about outsiders I didn't realize what a stand-in that was. I didn't realize I was writing about outsiders because that sense of otherness, that umbrella of otherness encompasses so much. And I think yeah. there's a reason, I mean, there are several reasons I think it speaks to young readers, especially. I think we all feel like outsiders. Yes. Yes. I think there are very few exceptions yeah. to that. See, it kind of goes part and parcel with why I write a, a lot about anti-heroes and villains and like, mm -hmm. and I think it's because I don't think when we read a character, we relate to their strengths. I think we relate to their failings. I don't think we look at a character, a hero, and they're being a badass. And we're like, I'm a badass and they're a badass. Look at this. No, we like relate to a character who's struggling. Yep. We see yes. the flaws and the flaws yeah. become the mirror element. And I think the same thing happens with outside, with feeling like you don't fit into your world because outsiders really come into two forms in fiction. It's like people who are physically from another place yeah. and people who are born insiders to a place and feel outside. Yeah. And I think I like writing both of them because I think both of them are really valid. I think sometimes yeah. it, it really is telling about the reader, which one they see themselves. In. Yeah. You but know, I, there's a, go ahead. No, no, that, not at all. It just, it, it brings to mind, there's a movement in the States, and I don't know if you keep up with it, 
um, in some states with um, politicians um, telling schools mm -hmm. you can't you can't have curriculum um, for um, gay kids, lesbian kids, trans kids, bi kids, yeah. and putting putting the stamp of of um, censorship on that. I wonder if that's something that you thought of. Oh, of course. I mean, all I can say is like, there are very few times I'm going to say, thank God for the internet, but thank God for the internet. Because like, yeah. at the same time, like the, the, the wealth of technology that, that many, not all, but many uh, youths especially have access to at least allows them to find their own path and find their own tribe and see themselves in a way that they wouldn't be able to 20 years ago. So that's like one of my only gratitude points. I think it's heinous. Um, I, I remember one of the first things that happened to me in publishing uh, didn't actually happen in the United States. I found out that my, one of my fantasy series, which has a queer romance in it, uh, was censored in Russia and I didn't find out, the publisher didn't tell me. I found out because I had a reader who read in both languages and did a side-by-side -side comparison and the publisher had gone through and <gasps> sized an entire plot line. Oh but they, did, they didn't tell they you? Didn't so they published you without telling you? Yeah, so I mean, it became like a big thing where like we had to cancel the contracts because they were in breach. But like, I just remember it was really the first instance that I had intimately with that kind of thing and that erasure and I had just come out publicly it was like literally within six months of that and I had I had really struggled for a long time about whether I wanted to come out publicly and, and since then I'm very grateful because I think having the luxury of platform and understanding that like I come from a place of such insulation and safety you know there's so I'm in so little danger compared to so many of my readers that it's the least I can do to show them oh, that like, that hey, you can have a future. Like, I swear, <laughs> like, I was pretty successful. Um, but <laughs> I, I, it, it's devastating. But like I say, I'm very, very, very glad for the internet uh, mm -hmm. because I do think that at least there's an accessibility where people can try and yeah. circumnavigate a lot of these horrific gatekeeping yeah. situations. Yeah, I, th I feel for kids who live in rural areas yes. um, where the libraries have taken books out of circulation and, and you know, there are school systems that have clubs um, for kids and that's being squashed. And um, I think about what could have happened to you if, if you had lived oh. in that experience as, as, a, as a kid. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it's just... I think it's one of the reasons that I and, and a lot of authors I know try to be as accessible as possible online. Often that accessibility yes. is really difficult because it's not great for, um, it, it conflates this idea of the author and the human and it erases the human. So often right. it's like a dehumanizing element, but I think one of the reasons that a lot of authors, especially those of us who do write for children and teens, try to persist with that accessibility is to like help make sure that there is visibility for for those who do need to see themselves and who do need to understand that they have advocates and that they're, you know, that, that there is a place for them. Yeah. Yeah. What an incredible thing to do with your gift. I mean, you've, um, you know, you've, you've written yourself this life and you're yeah. using what you've built to reach out and help other people, but not just people who, you know, might've been in the same, a similar position to you, but everybody. I mean, I think we all felt touchstones and things that helped us in, um, in your book. I, I know I did. I know I felt very connected to Addie LaRue and it made me um, ask a lot of questions of myself um, about, um, about fate and chance and decisions and a life well lived. And um, I just think it's a beautiful thing to do when, when you have a platform like that to, to use it for good, <laughs> to use your powers for good, not evil. A little bit like, um, like the broccoli and the mac and cheese. Like I'm like trying to like sneak <laughs> everything in. Like I'm like, yeah, like I'm like a mainstream fantasy author. Oh, there's like a gay romance. Just gonna put it in there. Like, you know, because I think that I the fact it. is like, I want to normalize as yeah. much of what has been othered as possible. And the way that you do that, unfortunately, is through success. And Absolutely. the only way to do it is through like to become successful enough that people, that those people in publishing will take risks. And because they won't see those risks as a, as a loss, they'll see those risks mm -hmm. as an opportunity. Or they'll be like, if, if I become a reference point 
Well, they say, well, we can take this risk because it worked for VE. Um, Then suddenly like somebody gets a chance taken on a book that, um, or a representation, a minority or marginalized person gets a much bigger opportunity because at the end of the day, publishing is about money and it sucks, but like they have to- But it's true. Yeah. Like there are reference points. They have to feel like there are comp titles that are successful enough that then, so I feel like the more successful I get, the bolder I get something like the all ages read something like queer existence, just taking up space in a narrative and not having identity have to be like a plot point, not yeah, being included absolutely. in a narrative just as a plot point. I try to do these things, the more successful I get so that I can then become a comp title. <laughs> so that yeah. like, well, it works. Well, I think it's interesting, too, that you um, your work showed you, yeah. right? You're saying, like, it was subconsciously yes. you didn't even know. And your work showed you. Because I think our work, like, our subconscious comes through our work to show us things about ourselves. And we're like, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. it provides vocabulary, doesn't it? Like, the thing that yes. you think about reading stories is they're not just transportative but they become mirrors as well as doors, yes. right? They reflect something back and suddenly we see ourselves in a way that we didn't before and yep. it can help create the vocabulary that we need in our own life. Yep. You're absolutely right. All right, Victoria, we have a ton of questions coming mm-hmm. in for you um, and we're going to grab a few in a second, but I wanted to read a comment first. Marilyn L. Willauer says, Victoria, I love how your face lights up as you talk about your books. It's truly inspiring. Um, I know we were all talking or thinking the same thing. And um, I wanted to ask a quick question from Linda Jacobs watching on YouTube, um, who wants to know, is Gallant a standalone or part of a series? A standalone novel. Um, I have both. So it's always good to ask. Thank you for asking. Um, but no, it is a standalone novel. It is just a little capsule. It's ideally read in a single day or a single sitting, but hopefully the kind of story that you walk away from afterwards and then it follows you. <laughs> that is awesome. All right, Patty, do you want to pull a live question for us? Yes. Um, Elizabeth Johnson Howard asks, and I, I'm picking this for very selfish reasons. I want to know, how did you decide to make Scotland your home? And yeah. what advice would you share about moving and living internationally in that way? So, how do you I, move? <laughs> I, so I'm fortunate. I'm a, I'm a dual citizen. So okay. my mom is English and my grandparents were both Scottish, which made ah, it a little okay. bit easier. Um, but what I will say is that uh, several years ago, I realized I was spending a lot of my career on the road, which is an incredible luxury. Like I'm very grateful to be able to do that as part of my job. But that meant that for me, vacation was coming home. And so yeah. I stopped and I started to really ask myself, what did I want that to feel like? What did I want my home to be since it was going to need to be this place where I feel creatively recharged, where I'm excited because when I'm home, I'm really writing. It's very difficult for me to write on the road, but when I'm home, I disappear into my work. And so I needed a place that was going to recharge my batteries. And the very first time I've always had wanderlust, I have wing tattoos behind both ankles. And, um, and the very first time I set foot in Edinburgh off the train, it just felt like all of the silt inside me settled to the floor. Oh my I just, gosh, I love that. I just love felt it too. Cool, you know? So mm-hmm. I felt like I tried to recapture that. And then um, every time I came back, it just got stronger and stronger and stronger. And so now this is where, this is where I live. It's amazing. Oh man. Um, uh, Mary Kay, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, and speaking of tattoos, Jonia Navarro wants to know, What's the tattoo on your arm? Okay. Well, I have, first of all, I have a key. um, And this is actually a real key, but it's so that all the doors in life will open for me. Love it. I have have a magpie and a crow. And this is because they're two members of the Corvid family, but they're really opposite connotations. So if you think about the magpie, it's kind of flighty and it likes to collect things, very shiny things, whereas the crow has a long memory and is very cunning. Mm. And I feel like these are the two aspects of my personality. (laughs) They're they're of a whole, they're of a family, but they definitely kind of have different energies to them. That's awesome. That's awesome. Christy, do you want to pull a question? Um, yeah, Melissa Osborne says, I loved the book so much. I did not want it to end. How did you decide on the time period and the research? Ooh, great question. Yes. Hi, Thomas. Um, sorry, the kitten is back. No, don't sit, <laughs> don't sit on me right now. Um, <laughs> I, um, for Addie, I am going to assume since this is the years and the research, yes, I, yes. I, um, 
I, it's so arbitrary. It's one of those like writerly things, right? I needed it to be long enough that it could, it could really separate itself into arcs. She really has three eras. And so these 300 years provide three 100 year eras where she really kind of goes through different stages of her own identity and development. Um, kind of like the five stages of grief, but shoved into 300 years. And I felt like more than 300 years, you start, it starts to lose its shape. Like time starts yeah. to lose its meaning. The other thing that was really tricky with Addie is, is essentially it's a Faustian bargain tale, but it's told through a female lens, which is really important because my whole issue with Faustian bargain tales, whether they're vampire tales or actual deals with the devil, is like the men in these stories, they like, like live forever. They like eat everything there is to eat. They see everything there is to see. They screw everyone there is to screw and then they get bored. <laughs> <laughs> and my whole thesis was like a woman would never get to move through the world that freely because of like the physicality of her body in time and in history. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I also needed it to be a period of time that Addie could retain her hope because mm -hmm. the whole thing that makes Addie LaRue a powerful character, I think, is that she is driven by stubborn joy and like a mm -hmm. relentless hope and optimism yeah. And I think that 300 years was the perfect almost tension point for yeah. the fatigue that she is just starting to feel in 2014, where it's really starting to almost calcify inside of her. Yes, absolutely. All right, Victoria, we love a good writing tip on this show. We love hearing the different advice. And I, I feel like, I think all of us feel like we could sit here and talk to you all night, but we're just asking for one writing tip. I wish you could give us 500 because I feel like it would just shape yeah. the course of the rest of my career. But... <laughs> would you mind sharing a writing tip with us tonight? So, and this is going to be a contentious tip because all writing processes are different. But what I will yep. say is that what I found that helps for me is that I come up with the ending first. Ooh, and the reason okay. I do this is because to me, the ending is the culmination of everything that you're working towards, the taste left in your mouth at the end of the meal. But I also, it's, I do it for multiple reasons. One is because I find writing books to be extraordinarily difficult. And I am very likely to quit if I don't have an end that I'm working toward. I need to have okay. something in sight because it takes a desert and it makes it a football field, right? Like I need to know that there's a finite amount of distance that I'm traveling. So on bad days, I won't quit because I know the end is right there. On Love good it. Days, I'm, I'm driven toward that end. And if I get stuck, I know, well, okay, I'm here and the end's here. So what's something that needs to happen between it? I know that I won't get lost. So I find it for, especially for those struggling with a first draft, have an ending that excites you. Oh, I love it. <laughs> That's great advice. <laughs> great advice. And do you, and do you plot it out really? Um, do you plot it out pretty in pretty much detail? I do because my anxiety would like not allow it otherwise. Like some people, they, I think there's this idea that if you're an outliner, you lack the discovery process. But for me, the discovery process is in the outlining, not in the drafting. And I find that having a plan, um, like to use another metaphor, it's like, I'm not, I'm not planning the road on which I'm walking, but I'm planning the terrain so that I don't walk off a cliff. Like I just need, I need a shape. Or else I start to get very anxious that I don't have enough story or that I'm not moving in the right direction. So for me, the outlining is like a is a creative engine, not a detriment. Love it. Love that. Okay. All right. Now, so we also usually ask authors to give us a book suggestion. We'd like that too. But we love that question. The New York Times Book Review asks authors, what book might, might we be surprised to find in your library or on your nightstand? Ooh, that's such a good question. Um, I have a lot of very weird books on my shelves. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think we'd be surprised. Right? Maybe we'd be surprised. I don't think anything would surprise anyone who has read any of my works. Like I have an entire <laughs> section on symbology. Um, no, there's no surprise. Nothing is surprising about it. Like nothing is surprising. Okay, I have a. I, I play violin. This is. Oh. Nice. I have violin music currently propped up on my bookshelf. I started violin when I was 32. Oh my god, that's so cool! Wow. Wow. I wanted to do it. I wanted it growing up, and I was told again and again, like, well, now it's too late, right? Like you're too old to start such a difficult instrument. And so when I turned 32. 
I started playing violin and I am terrible and I love being terrible because it is not my job. And so I'm allowed to be terrible. And when writing became my occupation, this thing that I loved suddenly had a like quantifiable measurement to it, a quality as well. And so being allowed to be terrible at something is so free. <laughs> That's that amazing. Awesome. I love right. that. All right, Victoria, if you would not mind sticking around for just a few more minutes, we have one additional question for you, but we are also cognizant of the fact that you were coming to us tonight from Scotland and it is almost one o'clock in the morning there and you are such a rock star for being up with us. Um, so it, we, have a, we have a few announcements, but then we're going to bring you back in for one question. We will try to talk fast. <laughs> this week on our Friends of Fiction podcast. <laughs> 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 this week on our Friends and Fiction Writers Block podcast, our friend Ron Block interviews Jennifer Smith and Diana Rostad about entering adulthood, meaning they did not write their debuts until well into adulthood. Adulthood. Oh, my gosh. And on the last episode, the one that comes out tomorrow, Ron and I talked to audiophile editor Robin and Fiona Hardingham in an episode titled, Are You Listening?, Fiona Hardingham is an audiobook narrator, and Robin is the editor of Audiophile Magazine. So remember that a new original episode drops each and every Friday. And if you want to make sure you never miss a podcast episode, subscribe wherever you get your podcast. And while you're in a subscribing mood, we'd love it if you'd sign up for our newsletter and our YouTube channel so you never miss a thing. You can also find selected back episodes of friends and fiction on the new online platform loco plus and if you are not hanging out with us yet in the friends and fiction official book club open a new tab on your computer right now or your phone <laughs> and go follow us but don't turn this tab off for heaven's sake um the group, which is run by lisa harrison and brenda gardner is now more than eleven thousand strong Join them on their Facebook page on March 21st, where they will be discussing the soulmate equation with Christina Lauren. And right now they're running a giveaway on the book club's Facebook page. You can win a gift pack from our new partner, Charleston Coffee Roasters. Enter by Tuesday and we'll reveal the winner live on next week's show. And if you want to keep track of what you think the soulmate equation and all of what you think of the soulmate equation, and all the other great books you're reading. As you may know, we're in month two of our Friends in Fiction Reading Challenge. We encourage you to pick up this Friends in Fiction Reading Journal from our partners at Oxford Exchange. It has quotes from all of us throughout and lots of great prompts to help you reflect on the books you've read. <laughs> this month, we're encouraging you to read a memoir or nonfiction as part of the challenge. And the journal is a great place to put it all down. And it's the first time I've ever journaled books. So it's been a new great experience yeah. for me. And Patty, don't you have a little something you want to talk to us about? Okay, Victoria, I'm going to make this really fast because I'm thinking about you at 1 a.m. in Edinburgh. No, 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 you're good, you're good. And you're ready to go on book tour, aren't you? You're getting ready to hit the road. Um, well, at the Savannah Book Festival, I told you all that I had a big announcement this week. So here I am. I am so excited to finally, after 18 months of writing a book in quietly, I mean, these ladies knew, <laughs> but I have been working on a book called The River Child, and here's what happened. While I was researching Once Upon a Wardrobe, I was struck by a tidbit of 1939 British history where there was an operation called Operation Pied Piper, where children from the cities were sent away, away from their families to protect them from bombings. So with luggage tags around their necks, gas masks dangling from their knapsacks, and a stamped address note for their parents when they found out where they might end up. These children were bundled onto trains and ships and sent off away from their parents to unknown occasions. So I imagined a pair of sisters, a mystery, a fairy tale, a rare bookshop in London, and of course a river, always a river, and a <laughs> missing child. And next year, you can read about them next summer of 2023. And I'm thrilled to join the Atria Books family. And we'll be talking about it more as the months go by. Yay! I'm so Yay! excited. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm so excited. I'm still kind of 
grinning about the whole thing. As you should be. (laughs) I still remember when you told me it was the last time we were all at Tybee together. And I was in your car and you were like, what do you think about this idea? And it was just so good. Magic. So excited. Totally magic. So we cannot wait for all of you out there. Make sure to join us for our next episode of Friends in Fiction next week, next Wednesday, right here at 7 p.m. Or we will welcome Colleen Hoover. Then on March 9th, we'll host Lisa Barr and Erica Roebuck and Rachel McMillan will join us for the after show. If you're ever wondering about our schedule, it's always on our Friends in Fiction website and on the header graphic on our Facebook page. And now back to Victoria. One question we always like to ask, what were the values around reading and writing when you were growing up? Oh, my goodness. Um, I mean, it was welcomed. It was welcomed. But I I would be lying if I said I was one of those children that grew up tucked into a library nook. I until I was 16, I thought I was going to play in the World Cup like I was an athlete. I was very, very much like outside. I I really struggled to find my stride in reading. Um, but I was intoxicated by the power of words. And so interestingly, all through high school, I, I never really touched novels. It was always poetry. It was always it. short fiction. It was always something brief and focused and transportative. Um, and so it wasn't really until I got to college that I almost kind of sank into and started to luxuriate in longer fiction. But I mean, it was welcomed. My, I think the reason I was attracted so much to poetry is my parents read to me before bed. And they would always read like Shel Silverstein and like small, very, very like the always poems, always like small little snippets of story. And I found that to be incredibly soothing. I love that. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Well, Victoria, what an absolute pleasure to have you with us tonight. Mm-hmm. We are so grateful for you being here, especially given the time difference. <laughs> um, and we're sorry to have kept you up till one in the morning, but man, we love talking what a, to you. What a way to spend the evening. I'm, I couldn't what a, what a night. Thank you. you so night. Night. Hey, are you coming, um, Victoria, are you coming to the States for the um, Gallant book tour? I am. I am. Well, maybe yeah. you'll go on our maybe you'll go on our friends and fiction page and tell folks where you're going to be. Probably, yeah. I would love to. Yeah. Maybe we'll track you down, like in a good way. In a good <laughs> yeah, way. like not, not in, in such a non stalker way. way. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I would love that. Thank you. <laughs> well, Victoria, thank you so much for being with us tonight. We loved you, and we wish you a great night. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Victoria. All right. Now to all of you out there, make sure to stay for our after show as GR McAllister, who you might also know as Greer McAllister, will be joining us. And don't forget that you can find all of our back episodes on YouTube. We are live there every week, just like we are on Facebook. And if you subscribe, you will never miss a thing. Plus, you'll have access to special short clips if I ever get my act together and start pulling them again. So be sure to come back next week, same time, same place, as we Welcome Colleen Hoover, and we will see you in the after show. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Wow. I wow. mean, am I the only one who feels like I have to go and start writing my next novel right now? I mean, like with all those, I, she was incredible. I loved her. Yep. And you know, it was so interesting. Like she was able to put into words. I think we all have that thing where the beginning stages, we like, we feel that book. Like we can, yeah. we can like see the whole of it in our mind. Yeah. But so often it's so difficult to get it to that like lofty vision. It was yep. she was amazing. That she was amazing. A lot of pull true. quotes, man. A lot oh of hashtags. Oh my gosh, I know. I know. My gosh, I feel like you could make a whole calendar of like inspirational <laughs> quotes for writers based on. What and it's you not said, even right? over. We have so much look more at, fun look coming. Look at Kathy oh, really was writing them down. That's what I'm saying. Awesome. Mm. All right. But I think that the inspiration of the evening is not even close to being over because we have another amazing author waiting backstage and we would love to tell you about her. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's me. (laughs) G.R. McAllister, who also writes best-selling historical fiction under the name Greer McAllister, is the author of the Five Queendoms series and a regular contributor to Writer Unboxed in Chicago Review of Books. 
Her novels have been named Indie Next, Library Reads, and Amazon Best Book of the Month picks, and they have been optioned for film and television. Her epic fantasy debut and the first novel in the fine in the Five Queensdom series, Scorpica, was just released yesterday, and we're so glad she's here to talk I'm to so us. Excited to talk about I know. Isn't right. that jacket? Isn't that an amazing it's jacket? Stunning, it's so gorgeous. gorgeous, stunning. Okay, Sean, can you bring Greer on? Hi, our friends. Hello, ladies. Welcome. Hello. It is so lovely to have you here, and congratulations on the launch of Scorpica. It just came out yesterday, right? It did, yes. So this is my first uh, first virtual event to kick everything off. All so right, we're so lucky. We're so lucky. To be here first. Can you tell us a little bit about this beautiful book? Yes, and I have it with me, so I will show it uh, as well. I'm, I'm in love with this. This is original is art amazing. that they had commissioned by um, Victor yeah, Nye, yeah. who's amazing. Um, so Scorpica, as you said, is the first book in the Five Queendom series, and it's set in a matriarchal world. So as you know, my historical fiction sort of has a theme of strong women and extraordinary circumstances, and they are you know, fighting nature or fighting crime or fighting the patriarchy uh, and, and all of the other um, things that, that American history is so full of. Uh, but I really wanted to do something different. And so this is a world where women are in charge uh, and has enjoyed 500 years of unbroken peace that way with, with five queendoms, each run by a queen, uh, until suddenly there is what uh, a phenomenon called the drought of girls and just babies, every baby is born a boy. It's just boys, 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 boys. No more girls are born. And it stretches on for days and weeks and months and then years. And so oh. the world of the five queendoms has to change and counter that. And that peace that was so established all of those centuries starts to crumble over time. So that's my that's my uh, feminist Game of Thrones kind of epic fantasy launch. That's <laughs> amazing. Love so that. cool. Wow. Well, this is such a departure for you. We're all familiar with your historical fiction novels, such as The Magician's Lie and The Arctic Fury, which we got to talk to you about on the show in an earlier episode. Um, so can you talk to us about going from writing historicals to writing sweep, a sweeping epic fantasy novel? Yeah, it's... Uh, on one hand, it's it's hugely different, and on on the other hand, it's not because historical mm -hmm. fiction and, and those of you who write um, things set in the past also know it's it's all world building, right? If you're yeah. if you're writing historical fiction, you're still choosing details and you're still drawing on you're still creating a world for the reader that doesn't currently exist. And in fantasy, it's it's more made up. And in historical fiction, you're drawing on research and you're drawing on our best approximation of what that world was actually like in 1850s Chicago or 1790s Savannah or whatever period you're writing in, you're constructing a world and you're trying to help the reader disappear into that world. Um, but with this one, I expect to get a lot fewer nitpicky emails. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's no such thing as that store on 7th Street, Greer. <laughs> right. yes. No. I mean, there, nobody can write to me and say, well, you said that the Scorpicans were hunting conies in mm -hmm. like the fall and conies don't, you know, that's not their, <laughs> their hunting season. I'm like, I made up Scorpica. I made up conies. I made, I made up everything. You cannot tell me I am wrong. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm sure people will complain about something cut. else. I had a panicky moment with a coat hanger earlier this week in yes. three and three with all of them. Yeah. So I understand. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah. sequins, you, you mean where someone told you about a coat hanger in your book? Not that you just panicked because you saw a coat hanger. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was like a coat hanger. Like, oh, my gosh. And then I was like, nope, nope. It's okay. It's okay. I was right. I was right. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so this is so original and so exciting. I cannot wait to read it. I need to know where it came from. I need to know what the spark or the origin or the beginning of this book was for you. I have to, before you answer, I have to tell you that one of my best five-star reviews tells me how realistic my blizzard was. So I think there <laughs> might have been a little crossover with the Arctic Fury since there's no <laughs> blizzards in Savannah. But... <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Our book came out right around the same time, Surviving oh, Savannah. That's so, that's so, so somebody gave you a five-star review, but I got it. 
So, <laughs> well. um, so I'm dying to know that the spark of this story is just so fascinating. It, it felt in a way like it came out of nowhere because it, it's funny when I was doing tours and events like this for historical fiction, people would say, oh, do you plan to always write historical fiction? And I would say, yes, because all of my ideas are historical fiction ideas. And then I should have known uh, one day an idea hit me and it was not a historical fiction idea. And I had to decide whether I was the one to write it or not. So it was really in, in a lot of ways a reaction to fantasy books that I had read that were classics, the TV show adaptation of Game of Thrones, just all of these very male dominated fantasy worlds. And I thought, well, I'd really like to read something that's, you know, more, more infused with feminine spirit has more female main characters has more women showing all the breadth and depth and different ways that women can be mothers and queens and warriors and, and whatever. Um, so really, first, I just wanted to read a book like that. And then I couldn't find one that was quite what I wanted. Uh, and then I talked to my agent and I said, I've got this idea. And even though she didn't represent fantasy, and even though it was so, so, so different um, from everything that I was doing, um, she said, if that's what you want to write, you should write it. Um, and then a multi-year journey began. But <laughs> but that's where, it, that's where it came from, was just wanting to have a book set in a matriarchy that wasn't a dystopia. It's not women are in charge and everything's terrible now. And it's not a utopia. Yay, women are in charge and everything's so much better. Uh, it's just, it's the foibles of humanity are the foibles of humanity. You're always going to have ruthless people and tenderhearted people and, and good mothers and bad mothers and, and everybody in between. Well, you said it was a multi-year journey. How long did it, I mean, obviously there's four more books coming, but how long did it take you to build the world and write just book one? I, I'm sort of a messy writer. So I, it didn't take me more than a year to get the first draft of oh, okay. the book done, but then it needed so many more drafts. Um, <laughs> Victoria Schwab was is so much more articulate about like smashing the glass orb and, and all of that. I, you know, it's perfect in my head and I ruin it by writing it down. Yeah, we um, all do. Yeah. But the, the, my writing process is rewriting. It's, I have to have something on the page and then I go back and I fix and I fix and I fix and I fix. Um, and then I also got a lot of input from um, my agent at the time who is still my agent, but only for historical fiction. She gave me her blessing to, to, um, get a, an agent just for the fantasy work. So both of them uh, had a, a great hand in helping shape it over time. Um, but that was that was the multi-year process. So for publishing, it was relatively quick because okay. <laughs> it was less than five years. Uh, <laughs> but it you know, but it still felt like rather rather an epic. Yeah, journey. that feels long. Yeah, yep. it does. Yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> In a blurb for Scorpica, our friend Kate Quinn, who who doesn't want a Kate Quinn blurb, who doesn't dream of that? Yeah. I mean, we're talking Alice Network, Huntre uh, The Huntress, and Rose Code. Um, she described it as a Game of Thrones for all the ladies out there who love Game of Thrones, but hated the Mad Queen finish. A richly drawn fantasy world peopled by fierce women, smart women, warrior women, women to make you stand up and roar. And I love Great that blurb. concept. What a blurb. That's yeah, yeah, exactly. Why do you think the time is right for a story like this? Of a world run by strong, capable women, you know, like us. <laughs> <laughs> I think the time's always right for that. You know, me too. To me, yeah. to me, never be enough yeah. books like this. And and I, I love that you uh, quoted the Kate blurb because Kate writes amazing books, but Kate also writes amazing blurbs. So she <laughs> yeah. does yeah. exactly how to, to sort of get to the heart of, of things. And I think those skills are probably linked. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, this is a genre where we can imagine absolutely anything, you know, historical fiction, we're somewhat bound by my historical fiction, some of it is very fact based, and some of it is more sort of in a loose jumping off point, um, you know, with made up characters and made up plots, but set in real places. Um, but there's still, there's still boundaries, there are still guidelines, there are still, um, you know, areas that we need to stay within. In fantasy and sci-fi, speculative fiction, you can do anything. There's absolutely no limit whatsoever to what you can do. So why don't we have more worlds run by women in yeah. fantasy? And there's more 
fantasy is much more diverse and more interesting than it used to be because it does still have sort of that um, reputation of being the male dominated knights and swords and, you know, epic quests and, and uh, just as, as that being the only thing that fantasy is and fantasy is so many more yeah. things than that. Um, so I'm really excited when I see strong female main characters. Um, but just to have a world where women are in charge because that's the way it's always been, it gets you, it gives you so much more to play with and it gives you so many more different ways to, um, to get invested into characters and to show characters. Cause you'll have something like Lord of the Rings where you only have a few female characters. And so they sort of represent all women and that's not how life is, yeah. right? We all know women who are all different things. Um, yeah. So you really need uh, as many of those characters as possible, I think. Yeah. So career with this whole story, this whole um, series now stretching before you that you started off with Scorpica, um, do you see yourself just doing that for a while or will you still keep a foot firmly planted in historical fiction? I'm still, I'm still playing around with some historical fiction ideas, so I can't rule it out. I do have okay. annual deadlines for- um, I was gonna say, you got a big this. series ahead of you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I got a lot of this going on, but- uh, <laughs> you do. At least I didn't call it like the 10 queen of so I, yeah. <laughs> I feel like five is kind of a good number. Um, and I'm actually only contracted for three right now, so I'm hoping, I'm, you know, I've got five in, in my head. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I'm, I'm committed to that. I'm moving forward with that. I very much hope to write in this world. I feel like now that the world is built, I could just play around in it forever. Um, but I do also have a couple of intriguing women from American history, which is my specialty in historical fiction. Um, I still have a couple of those that I feel like if nobody else gets around to writing about them, I want to. That's awesome. I love it. Well, Greer, it was such a delight to have you here tonight. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, and yeah, it was so great to see you again. Happy so, Pub Week. Happy Pub Week. It's so you. exciting. I've been Absolutely. looking so forward to this. And I wish nice I had a glass of champagne to raise because this this feels this feels very festive. This is a I great way to start this off. <laughs> you know, you know Greer, I hope I hope that people will check you out on um on your social media because I saw a beautiful picture that you posted yesterday of the cover of Scorpica with a beautiful glass of champagne. And yes. it was just, it, I just looked at it and I thought like, oh my gosh, that's art. That's beautiful. So I hope <laughs> yeah. everyone goes on and checks that out. I hope they check out the book too. It's so wonderful. to all of you out there, thank you for joining us. And thanks as always for all of the kindness and support you show for us and for other members of the Friends in Fiction community. We loved seeing so many of you in Savannah last weekend, and we hope to see many more of you on the road in the coming months. We adore you, all of you, and we are so glad you're here. Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone.